So as we pick back up and we try to kind of remember what we've had thus far in 1 Peter, we've seen he wrote this letter to five provinces, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Asia, and Bithynia. And we've covered one chapter thus far, part of chapter two. We'll finish chapter two today. But Peter is writing this letter to a whole bunch of people because either they're going to be facing some levels of persecution or they have already started facing uh, uh, those sort of things um, by the hands of their government at the time, which was the Romans. And this letter wasn't for everybody. This wasn't something that they pass on. They're like, just read this at just someplace in public or whatever. This was specifically for the Christian bodies in those provinces. And we may ask, well, why, why is this happening? Why would the government be punishing these Christians? What do they do to deserve that? The answer is probably more than likely nothing. The Christians was not a a, a widespread faith at that point. It was growing, but as anything is in in the early days, things that was small as it picked up, and it was a growing faith. And back then when things go wrong, the Romans and others needed somebody to blame on when things happened. Like we talked about, you know, Nero setting fire to his own city to burn it down to rebuild it in his own image. And obviously any emperor who does that sort of thing, it's not going to make him very popular if he admitted it. And so he said, well, the Christians did it, right? And that's kind of what happened in those days. Is sometimes the Christians would have to take the rap for stuff they had nothing to do with. Um, and unfortunately, when blame came around, so did punishments and persecutions and things of that nature. It took it took place in a variety of different ways, whether it was being displaced from um, being exiled from their, their land and their communities and that sort of thing. They could have been jailed. They could have been beaten. They could have, there's a lot of put to death that happened as well. We don't know exactly the extent uh, by the writings here what these people were facing particularly. It could have been different from one province to the next. We don't see that picture exactly. But when we left off the last time, we, we saw a picture that, pay, that Peter painted us and of those Christians because he said, as you continue building your life, what's the foundation that you have beneath your feet that you're building on? He said, I hope that's not you or, or something else because, you know, earthly things are flimsy. We're not flawless. He said, that can be dangerous if we build our lives on our wants and our thoughts and our desires and all of those things. And he says, but instead of doing that, you should keep Jesus as the cornerstone or the foundation of your life. And Peter's telling him all these things because it's clear he cares about them and, and what they're going through. There's very little doubt he wants them to live a good life that's going to set them on the path to heaven. And he wants them to be encouraged despite their trials and, and grounded in who they are as chosen people together and, and individually as men and women of God. And that idea is going to continue today. We're going to see some similar themes of what we've seen in previous weeks, but he's going to kind of add on to some of those ideas as we go. And as he does that, he's, he's going to kind of touch on something that might feel kind of like a poke in an open wound for these people um, in the text. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but Peter has some more words of wisdom that he wants these people, as well as us, to have for, for their lives and for us, um, for our good. And so that's kind of where we've been to this point, uh, just to get our headspace into kind of what we've seen thus far. We're going to dive back into the text, and um, that is in First Peter chapter 2. It's, we're going to cover 14 verses. We got from 11 to 25 today, if you want to open your Bibles. If not, we will throw that up on the screen, and we'll read it together. And it says this. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God and honor the emperor. Slaves. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, 
he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were uh, like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. There's quite a bit to unpack here um, with our verses that we have. And as we look at what Peter has for us today, he continues to talk about these individuals facing hardship, and he begins this section by calling them his friends. And I really appreciate that Peter adds this into the letter because he certainly doesn't have to. Like some people he's writing to, he would have visited and spent some time with and had some relationships based on what we know the travel of Peter had done to this point. So he may have knew, known some of these people he was writing to. But I would imagine there are plenty of those getting this letter he wasn't close with, that he didn't know personally. And Peter could have led with, by decree of the early church authority and leadership, by being a direct apostle of, a, of Jesus, I hereby state this is the required response for all Christians moving forward. Please read this and pass it on. But he doesn't. He doesn't say, Christians, I'm instructing you. And he had some leadership and authority to his name. I mean, he was a close follower and friend of Jesus here. But he says, my friends. So he wants them to know, I care about you. I don't know about you, but when I receive a card or if I have somebody come up to me and they say, my dear friend, I don't know, that just means something to me, right? That we have this bond of friendship. And he knows that this faith that they both have, that the, these groups, him and the groups have this bond of faith together that unites them under Christ. And, and, and so he knows that that's what they have. And he doesn't start by giving orders to these early churches. He says, I urge, I, I'm giving you this suggestion because I, I think it will help you all with how you handle what's going on. And again, he makes reference of since you are foreigners and exiles in the land, meaning that you're in this world, but you're not of this world, and that you may be in the world at the moment, but we as Christians know this is not our home. We're just passing through. So he brings the topic up again, as we've seen in previous weeks. And he says, since we are God's people who are living as exiles and strangers in this world, he said, I would recommend that we abstain from sinful desires. Nobody's jaw dropped there. Right? This is something we've heard probably multiple times before. And, he, and it's interesting because he gives us some pretty strong details of what he thinks sinful desires do to us. Because he doesn't just say, don't do them because they're not good. He says, no, these things literally wage war against our souls. It's an incredibly vivid description that he doesn't have to give. But he felt the need to really say the specifics as to what sin does to us. And this word term that he uses here, soul, is a similar writing that Paul uses when he says spirit in Paul's writing. And they use that to refer to the dimension aspects of, of us as people that relates to God. And he's saying that evil comes and battles against us to try to get us to fall to temptations of all kinds so that it would get this uh, opportunity to get us to separate from God and create this barrier, this separation between us and him. And it's something that we face daily in this life. You know, we have God who wants to, us to pull closer into him and evil creeping, trying to pull us away. But evil and the enemy tries to be sly about it when it happens. It doesn't always come at us like a forceful pull in one direction. Sometimes it just comes as a, just a slight tug off to the side. We can kind of reference that from the, the, the first sin, the, the fall and the beginning of the book of Genesis, right? Because... Uh, you know, God had given Adam and Eve the, the garden, and, and they're in there. They're minding their own business. They're doing their own thing, and the serpent just happens to slide his way in. And when he does that, he says, look over there. Look at that tree. Doesn't that fruit look so good? You should try that out. And God had given them instruction. You have anything in the garden, anything. Just don't do that one. It was not for your good. Just hear me out. It is not good. It, it will lead to death. That is not what you want to do. And Eve says, well, I don't. God said, I don't think we're supposed to do that one. That one's not a good one for us. We're, we're going to die if, if we eat from that one. And the devil says, ah, you're not going to die. He told you that? Really? No, surely not. You'll be fine. Don't sweat it. He downplays the entire thing. It's not that big of a deal. And all of it was intended to do was harm Adam and Eve. Serpent didn't care if they ate. Serpent didn't care if they got that thing. He wanted them to chase after their own interests that were apart from God. One thing, don't go to the tree. What does the serpent want him to do? Go to the tree, right? 
And what looked enticing actually brought them nothing more than momentary gratification when they decided to go for it. And then it was followed by this prolonged shame and guilt, and they went and they hid because of what they've done. It wasn't about fruit or temptation. It was about trying to get God's people off of a close relationship with God. So evil intends to do. It's nothing more than an attempt to pull us down. It didn't look like that at the surface for Adam and Eve, and oftentimes it doesn't look like that in our lives either. Right? We can read Genesis whether three or whatever, and we can read the fall, and we'd be like, I'd notice that. I wouldn't fall for that. It's not as clear as that always, right? Happens in a ton of different ways. Peter knows this. I mean, his, he, he knows this well. His friend, Judas Iscariot, was also one of the 12 disciples. And he decided to trade information over to the people who wanted Jesus dead for some money, right? He's seen all kinds of sin. I mean, he spent time with various peoples of all the, dan- the, the lands. He's, he's seen the struggles of all kinds. I mean, he's currently in Rome as this letter is being written. And, and, and Rome was a place where sin abounded. Like, we think of, like, Las Vegas today. You know, like, what's the, the, ner- the term that's t- commonly coined, the name? Sin City, right? Well, Rome back then would have been right up there with Las Vegas because it had all kinds of sexual sins taking place. There was violence. I mean, we're, at the time of this writing, we're a few years away from the Colosseum being built, which was a place that serviced, basically, it, it was a place where people could gather to watch people fight to the death for fun. For entertainment, people would go to enjoy those fights. There was greed, there was gluttony, there was pride, there was lust. You name it, and it was happening in Rome in abundance. So Peter's witnessed firsthand the pagans' lifestyles. He knows very well all of the different kinds of sins that are out there. And it should be known, Peter's not just hiding away in the church in Jerusalem writing this letter. He is amongst everybody in Rome. And he's hanging out with these people, and he's writing to these people who are dealing with these pagan leadership's afflictions. And when that pressure is put on these Christians, he knows there's going to be eyes that are going to be on these Christians into, in regards to how all of these people see what they do. They're going to be watching what the Christians do when the government starts throwing waves of persecution at them. Peter knows it. It probably was happening in, in Rome initially, and it probably expanded from there. So th- they might be dealing or being close to dealing with these things, but it might be something Peter has already witnessed firsthand. But Peter knows people are going to be watching to make their comments about the Christians, about what they did after what these people do to them. And he says, live such good lives among those pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he comes. And I really love that Peter says, live such good lives. Because he knows the Christians were under attack and they were probably being accused of things left and right from not only the government, but probably the people in those lands too. I'm not saying all of them were doing it, but they were probably jumping on that narrative too. Imagine if you lived wherever, you know, if it's Forest or Upper or Cary or here in town, and let's just say a restaurant was robbed, right? And the Christians had such a bad reputation that when the, the, the police show up, they take a look around and they're like, yep, this is probably the Christians doing. Maybe even the Christians over at Wharton first. I mean, you know, the emperor or the president said this is what they do, and here it is, pretty open and shut case if you ask me. Could have happened. And we talked about it several weeks ago, right? If we owned uh, a, a, let's say, a, a store of some sort in a, at a marketplace, and we, store, we sold our items, our crafts that we made, whatever, and one day the Roman soldiers come in and say, we know you're a Christian, and by a decree of the Roman government, we're seizing this property, and they take all of the stuff that we sell, they throw it out in the street, and they burn it in front of everybody to show this is what happens when you're a Christian. If that were to happen, we may want to retaliate and start burning some of the stuff of the Romans in response. We may want to do some things on our own. But in doing that, it would feed into the narrative that these Christians were bad because look at what they're doing. This is what we're talking about, right? You know, they talk about following this Jesus who is perfect and holy, and here they are trying to burn Roman offices down and trying to attack people and doing all these things. The printing press wasn't invented back then, but what do you think the tabloids would have said? if the newspaper was printed back then? Do you think it would say, Roman officials are doing this to Christians and taking them from them, displacing them, beating them, doing all these things, or bad Christians destroy Roman property and further wreak havoc on communities? I think we can guess which one. 
what would have probably been the driving story, even though it wasn't the whole story. And so perception is at play here, I think. And I think Peter wants these people to be aware of that. And he wants to see and hear Christians living to glorify God and staying focused on doing good needs, good deeds regardless of what these people are throwing at them. But honestly, I think this is more than just trying to build a reputation. I think Peter just wants these people to stay true to who they are in Christ as men and women of faith. And as he does that, he begins to lay out these guidelines, if you'd like to call them that, here in our text. And he begins to say, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And he could have stopped right there and kept it at that, but he didn't. He wanted them to hear who he meant when he said that. And he said, whether that's the emperor, who is the human supreme authority in the land, who has the final say in all these current earthly matters, or to the governors. And so Peter is telling these Christians, you should honor and respect Nero and your governor, whoever that could be. And I'm sure as people were reading this letter, and as they were hearing these words, that if it was read out loud to the church bodies, I could imagine all of these Christians saying, I think Peter lost his marbles. I think he's crazy. What is he talking about? He, he wants us to honor and respect Nero, the guy who, I lost my job, my house because of him. All this grief that we're suffering was at the hand of Nero. I, no. Are you kidding me? I mean, it literally, it was by Nero waving his hand towards the Christians as to why they're dealing with these sufferings. I am certain, if you're curious, this would have not been their favorite part of this letter. I'm certain of it. I mean, Nero is one thing, but if our governor, let's just call him Steve for the sake of the, whatever. We'll call our governor Steve here in this story. Let's say, okay, Steve gets a letter from, from Nero, and he said, all right, I'll do all, I got the letter. I get, I'll do all the stuff he wants. He wants, us to stop, he wants us to stop having the Christians meet, take from them, do all of that stuff. I'll do all of that, but I have an idea. I'd like to line my pockets in the process. So when we're taken from the Christians, we know the local Christian body. When we go up to them, I'm going to charge them a Christian tax on top of that. And so as we're taken from them, we're going to go ahead and take some of their extra money. I'm going to funnel 80% of that up to the Roman authorities above me. They're going to think I'm a genius. I'm going to pocket that other 20%. They kind of had the free reign to uh, handle how they're going to carry out those punishments, how they pleased. And so, you know, people may have said, I've heard of Nero, but I've never seen him. But that Steve needs to go. Nero may live in a mansion in Rome, but Steve lives in a decent house down the road. I can't get to Nero, but I can get to Steve, which is obviously what Peter is saying, and to avoid and to not do those things. He says, you as a Christian should respect and honor that person despite what they're doing to you. And I'm sure people were thinking, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. I'm going to, at the very least, talk bad about him. I, I might just take matters into my own hands, right? And Peter, I'm sure he can sympathize with that too. Because I'm sure Peter's carrying out this same directive in his life as he's telling all of these people. Like I said, we're writing, he's writing this in Rome. And I know he's not doing all of these things in his life because he has just this warm, fuzzy feeling inside of him that, oh, I should be doing this. This feels so good. He's doing it because he knows it's right, which is why he's passing it along. And he says, for it is God's will that when you continue to do good and live right, then it will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. That's a good nugget there, isn't it? That's good. That's, that's something we can take away from this writing. I'll say that again. For it is God's will that when you continue to do good and live right, then it will silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. That's interesting. Peter says people are going to have things to say about you and who you are and what you do and all of that. We all know what that's like. And Peter says don't feel like you need to defend who you know you are to them. Don't argue back. Don't take jabs or feed into what they're trying to get you to do. But he says live out God's will. Keep doing good things. And he says when you do, then those ignorant and foolish voices will eventually quiet down. They will lose steam over time. It's good advice. And it's true. At this point, Christians had a bad reputation going around about them. We see that clearly in the text. And so what they do? They did what Peter recommended, and it worked. And the truth came out of the whole situation that the Christians weren't bad. It was actually Nero. He was just insane. He was. If you ever get bored, you can look up the, the history of Nero. It came out that he was a pretty crazy guy. Um, 
And it showed that the Christians, you know, were not what they were saying about them. And it didn't happen in just one moment of time that they said, nope, you know, they, they showed with their lives that, that, you know, the things that are being said about them, that's not who we are. That's not us. They didn't need to defend that they weren't what people said about them because how they lived their lives showed who they were. People saw more and more actions of the Christians as they were accused of all these things, and people were able to witness that nothing was true. And over time, it became a, really? Christians are bad? You saw them helping the poor person down the street. They're kind, they're gentle, they love, they help others, they do this, they do that, on and on and on and on. And eventually they got, oh no, that those things were lies. Peter seems to think the proof is in the pudding and not the fickle words from the mouths of fools. So he says, those shallow words won't make it far, friends, because the depth of your character will show the real picture. And he wants them and us to hear that as well. But Peter knows at this point they are at a crossroads. They have to make that decision to live that way for those things to happen. Because if they feed into all this stuff and they act in rage or malice or deceit or or anger or or hate or any of those sort of things, then people will be like, see? And so he tells them, brothers and sisters, you are free people. You have a free will that God has granted. You can go in any direction in which you choose from this moment on. But he says, don't use the freedom that you have as a cover-up for evil. Essentially, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? We could be walking down the street. We can see a wallet laying on the side of the sidewalk there. We can pick it up. Oh, there's some money in there. We can pocket that, toss it back, right? We can talk bad about people behind their back. We can do all kinds of things, right? But Peter says, don't use the freedoms we have as a cover-up for evil. And instead, he says, we should live as God's slaves, that's a, not a typical term we place on ourselves, if I had to guess. If, if someone says to us, what, you know, if somebody asks, what are you as you believe? What would you call yourself? It's a Christian, Christ follower, faithful, something of that sort. But rarely would we think of the term, as Peter used here, as slaves of God. Maybe we do. Probably not, if I had to guess. And freedom meant quite a bit back then and does today. If you were a free man or woman, you had the ability to make whatever decision that you wanted. And that mindset was a dangerous one. That's why sin was so prevalent in those lands, because people use their freedoms in all kinds of ways uh, for deadly sins of the flesh and chasing after things and saying and doing as they pleased. And Peter says, we don't look at our free will as the freedoms to just run whatever way we want to at a particular moment. We are not a blade of grass that is tossed up and blows whichever way the wind's blowing. He says, instead, we live as God's slaves. And while that sounds negative, it's not intended to be a negative thing. It's more like a servant serving a master type thing. Because while we listen to the authorities that are in place, whether it's the governor, the emperor, or otherwise, he said when it comes down to it, our authority and who we, true, who we truly submit to over everything else is God. It's like Daniel in the Old Testament. You guys were covering Daniel this morning too. I just feel like there's always that parallel. It always seems to work that way. But Daniel in the Old Testament, right, he followed the rules. He worked for the king. He was a good man uh, of God. He, and he did all of those things until the king made a rule that for 30 days, can't pray to any god, can't pray to any man outside of the king if you do your throne into a lion's den. Daniel had to say, uh, I'll follow the rules, but earthly administration cannot supersede my relationship and my direction that I follow from God. We're told we should respect and honor our leadership even when we don't agree, because we can see here, these people did not like the emperor. They did not like their authority figures. But he says, while these people should have our respect, God is the one who has our hearts at the end of the day. That's it. And he says, if God has our hearts and we live as his servants, then in, seven, in verse 17, Peter says we should follow these things. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. It's a simple framework that he lays out for how we use our freedom. It's a pretty basic design to follow. It's a sentence long. A few words per instruction. And Peter seems to think we as Christians can go pretty far in this life and beyond these days on this earth with a life posture like this. I mean, several weeks ago we were talking about holy living and the characteristics that would line up right along with how a holy person would live. And he said this should be geared towards the people in our lives regardless if they're harsh or if they're really friendly towards us. shouldn't matter. And he reflects on that thought there at the ending with how he witnessed people question Jesus and rebuke him. They arrested him when, they did nothing, when he did nothing wrong. 
And he had to have thought about it. Like, imagine, this is Peter writing this letter right now. Like, he had seen personally, firsthand, the people come up to seize Jesus. He gets out his sword. He, tr- he cuts off the ear of a high priest's servant. And when he does that, Jesus says, no, Peter, that's not how we respond to people when they wrong us. He says, Jesus took those things, and yet he didn't feel the want or the need to retaliate. He says, you know, when he suffered at the hands of the pagans who were beating him and putting him to death, he could have stopped it, and he never even made as much as a tiny threat towards them. He could have gotten angry or or bitter or lashed out or quit or spoke negatively about them, a number of things. But he chose to honorably suffer for the sake of many. And Peter's calling on these Christians who are in a really tough spot to frame their lives and their mindset to their example and to their Savior. He tells them, I know hardships and difficulties are not fun. They are not easy in the least. But it's better to stand on what you know is right and hold to that than to reduce yourself down to the levels of people who are trying to pull you down. He says, don't let the hard days be the exception to you holding firm to the faith you hold dearly. He says, don't let the chatter from the peanut gallery get to you. They're going to say what they want to say about you, but our actions will silence the foolishness in time. He says, don't let the pressure from the current leadership or really just generally the things going on around us to let sin wage its war against our souls. Because those are the different ways evil tries to find its way in. It's through things like that. And Peter sees it. He knows well the devil will sliver his way around trying to find a way to get God's people to fall. Peter knows these things are happening at this moment in time at these places. And that's not the same things we're seeing today. But the same idea holds true for us today. Because godly living was just as hard to do in Galatia and Rome as it is today. We don't need Roman persecution for sin to be on attack for our souls. If you don't believe me, we can take a look at the numbers. In 1974, there was a survey done about people's faith. 92% of Americans said that they were Christian, that they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 92% of Americans. I mean, it's a pretty good number. 100 would be ideal, right? But I mean, 92%, that's hopefully a lot of people going to heaven to have eternal life with Jesus. Same survey done, 2020. That number went from 92 in 50 years, has dropped down to 64%. The American church has lost 30% of its church body in 50 years. There's a lot of things that have happened in the last five decades. I can't point to anyone. I mean, there's probably extensive writing that is done on this particular topic. But we could look at a couple things that has been going on over the course of time. And I'm not pointing at one of these two things. There are several. But look at what's been going on. In 1962, 1963, the Supreme Court says there is no more corporate prayer in in, in schools. You can't do it. Absolutely not. I mean, if you want to pray for your individual lunch before that, you can do that. No prayer there. By 1973, a store started to open up on Sundays. When prior to that, they remained closed, and people would spend time with family. They would rest, and they would go to church. Now people are starting to work their Sundays. And now police officers, you know, firefighters, nurses, there's several professions that have always worked on Sundays as well. And I'm not saying you're bad if you work Sundays or anything like that. Please don't hear me say that's not the case. But I'm just pointing out a couple things that have changed, and I think there are several I think there's a lot of things that's happened, and there's many factors that go into it, but Jesus, over time, was now being removed, whether it was the schools or our Sundays or our routines, whatever it was. Let's look at the numbers on the other side of the coin. In 1970, the percentage of atheists in America was about one in every 10 people. It's actually less than that. It was 5 to 8%, right? That number has jumped up to 23% today as well. So while one went down, the other one went up shot up and it makes one wonder why in 50 years does christianity in america go from over 90 percent to under 65 and atheism goes in, uh, to from less than 10 percent and almost three to five times that amount in that same amount of time i i don't think people woke up from their beds one morning and said yeah i just don't agree with the christian doctrine anymore I, i'm just thinking differently all of a sudden I don't think that happened. There's nothing that gives us evidence to support that. 
But the devil doesn't move all at once. I think he masks his efforts in slow and deliberate efforts if we can remove Jesus here and here and here. If it becomes less of a priority today, then the next generation will look at it as this way too or maybe less. And in the meantime, all the media will have every single thing to watch that encompasses greed, lust, hate, violence, and all the stuff you can think of. And rarely do we see Jesus on our media unless we search for it. I mean, as I was writing this like a month ago, um, I, I saw something come up on my computer. There was, I was on YouTube, and there was an artist who made a music video. has 18 million views, million with an M. And in this music video, this artist, I guess you, you want to call him that, depicted himself on a cross, crucified. He went up to heaven, and he had a halo around, and he was dancing around and had the word sex across his neck. He went down to hell, and he was dancing around a cauldron with arms and legs poking out of the cauldron. It's really a, kind of a nasty video, honestly. You can find the video. It came out not long ago. I'm not going to say their name because I'm not going to promote it, but it's out there. It's not the first time the media has done that sort of thing, and it's not going to be the last. And that's what the kids see. Let's be clear this morning, that's not for you and me. That's for the next generation, for them to consume. So they don't see Jesus on a cross dying for our sin, but a mockery of that. That's for the next generation, so they can see that. See, I think the enemy is still working against us as he was back in the first century and trying to get these early churches squashed right from the beginning. I just think he's using some different tactics today. How do I get Jesus out and darkness in. The sad part of it is, is it's worked. The numbers show it. Church doors are closing. It's not some made-up statistic. It's happening. Peter tells us in this letter, the enemy is waging war, but we've got to remain strong in the faith. We have to hold tight to God because he's got this living hope. He wants to see us saved, and he loves us so much. And he says, if you hold true to what you know is right, you'll live a good life and one that honors God and shows him off as you go. And that's what they did. Not only did the church back in the first century, not only did they make it through these waves of persecution, the church body grew. And they grew. And they grew. It's because they respected their authorities. They loved one another. And they loved and revered God. And they ended up spreading the gospel through the lives that they lived and the words that they shared with those they came in contact with. And that's what we need. That's what we want to see. Not only for ourselves, but for our kids. For our kids' kids. For a thousand generations. What is the church going to look like for our kids' kids? I don't know. We've got to share Jesus to our friends and our families and the strangers. We need to see people saved. We need to pe have people come to know Christ and his hope and his love and his salvation. That's what this world needs. That's what this country needs. That's what this community needs. And they're not going to find it in the media or for things around them. They're going to hear that from us. And I know you're with me when I say, I don't want to see one more person fall in this area to destruction or death I want to see God moving this community. I want everyone to have this eternal hope and salvation and this joy of Christ just built up in their hearts. But Peter is saying the church has to be the church at every stage in history. This is our moment. God has put us here at this place and at this time. If we want to see God moving, we got to be deliberate. we got to get excited about it. If we have questions about our faith, I invite you to come talk to me or an elder. If, if you feel like you're, you feel a stir in your heart, you need to take a step of obedience, you haven't been baptized, let's talk about those sort of things. If you, if you have somebody that you know doesn't know Jesus, invite them to church. They may say no, but it might change their lives forever. The tides eventually turned for the Christians because they held tight to the words that Peter gave. They clung tight to Jesus and each other, and they continued to do good work, and, and they shared Jesus with others. That can be us too. We can pull together as a church family for the sake of one another and for the sake of those on the outside of these church doors watching. 
We are at a stage right now where the church is diminishing and we have an opportunity to shine our light and for those people who have not seen Jesus to be that witness. I I don't know about you guys, but I believe that God heals lepers. I believe that he makes the blind see. I believe that he makes the deaf hear. And I believe he raises people from the dead. I've seen him work in my life personally, and I think you all have too. And I think he can build up this community for his glory. And I think he can use us for that so others may come to know Jesus. I mean, that's his words, right? The Great Commission. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was for his disciples to go and make more disciples, right? Eternity is at stake. Let's do something this week that's radical. In a world that's talking less and less and less about Jesus, let's talk about Jesus. Let's live a life that honors him and show the devil that he has no place in our hearts, our homes, this church, or this community. There are going to be people around us soon that don't know Jesus, and we can't afford to let that number grow anymore. We can't afford that anymore. Be the friend who invites their friend to to church. I'm not saying that as a plug for Wharton first. Let, Let them know about Jesus and tell them to get plugged into a church where they can have a place where they can come to know the Lord. It may just change their lives. It may change their kids' lives. More people will come to know him. I mean, God, at the end of the day, is going to win this one. We, we know that he will. God's still got this. So we can rejoice in that. But we should sing boldly today that God is going to do something powerful in somebody's life soon. I'm telling you, my life was changed with a simple invitation to go to church. It's true. And he's going to continue using our efforts for his salvation plan moving forward. So let's do those, my friends. And may God continue pouring into your lives, giving you peace and wisdom and many blessings as we go. Let us close this morning with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we close this morning with hearts of joy because, God, we have food in our bellies. We had warmth in this place. God, our needs are met. And all we have is from you. God, you've watched over us from the beginning. And you've never given up on us, even when we ran off. God, there's nothing we can do to thank you for all you have done. But may our lives be a reflection of our gratitude and love for you. God, we pray that more would come to know you. And that we could be the vessels that you use so that others would know of this wonderful hope that's right at their fingertips. God, we pray that your light shines so bright that all come to see it. And God, we pray for our own hearts and the things we're dealing with. Help us to navigate our next steps. Protect us as we go. And may all evil that comes our way be thrown off our path. God, we live to serve only you. And God, we just thank you for all you've done and all you're going to do. And may our last song of worship come directly from our hearts, praising you, who is worthy of every wonderful note and word. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those who are able, would you please stand for one last song of worship?
and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you. before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you schedule or anything, but that kind of worked well for the sermon, I thank goodness, that worked out. As we leave this place, may we live out the simple framework that Peter gives the church today. May we be respectful to everyone. May we love others well. May we always show reverence and love to God in our lives. And may we honor the authority that's above us. We have freedom ahead of us as we leave this place. How are we going to use it? People have strayed with freedom, but we have a chance to pull things back and make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others. 
Will we use our time and talents for Christ this week? It could make a world of difference. In a world that's moving away from Jesus, let's get him back to the forefront of life. Let's go forth loving God and serving one another. Let us pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. For the, ta- the time we're able to share in this place. And God, we ask as we leave this place that you'd help us find some rest in this day. That whatever we may have going on in our lives, that we could, we could find peace and hope in you today. We ask that you would be with us. May your face shine upon us and guide us each and every day. May we look more like you and your love as we go. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thanks for being with us this morning.